Now, there were a number of factors which continued to favor keeping the policy rates on hold. One is this relatively slow growth, the relatively muted growth, and the output gap that persists. That clearly argues in favor of keeping the policy rates on hold and not raising them. The second factor is the tight liquidity conditions in the market and raising rates and tightening liquidity further would be counterproductive at this point. The third factor is that there are high nominal and real interest rates at the moment. And so we are in a kind of neutral stance verging towards tight. And at this point, with growth at in below 4%, uh, clearly uh, it's not advisable to tighten any further. So that's another reason for keeping the rates on hold. And fourth reason is the fact that inflation is very much within our target. Uh, the September headline inflation rate has come down to 4.3%, and as you know, our target range is 4 to 6%. And the, the core inflation, which monetary policy can influence is now uh, less than 3%. So inflation is well contained, growth is relatively muted, plus money supply and credit growth are moderating and are at levels we are comfortable with. So these are the reasons arguing for keeping rates on hold. Now, there are also one or two reasons why one could argue for an increase in rates. And those tend to be oriented more towards the uh, external front. One is rising int international interest rates. As you know, the Federal Reserve is normalizing its interest rates. And as you saw in the presentation, they've already had three increases this year and are likely to have another one in December and possibly three more next year. So rates are going up abroad. And therefore, the inflation differential between ourselves and the global risk-free rates, which are the benchmark US Treasury rates, is getting compressed. So the incentive for people to invest money, particularly institutional investors, to put money into Sri Lankan uh, rupee instruments is being reduced. So it should we adjust for that? That is one reason for increasing, uh, one ca case for increasing rates. Uh, and in link to this, normalization of interest rates in the US, and also anticipated tightening in Europe as well next year, uh, and some slight tightening in Japan, all of which will mean that money will flow out of uh, emerging markets. Uh, there is again a case for saying, let's raise interest rates. So normalization of interest rates, the strength of the dollar, the outflows of money from emerging markets, all this uh, argues for uh, an interest rate increase. Another factor uh, for in favor of increasing interest rates is the fact that the trade deficit has been increasing. <coughs> now, the, so on balance, the uh, monetary board decided to keep rates on hold. So what are some of the reasons why it did so? Why did it come out in favor of keeping rates on hold rather than increasing interest rates, particularly to protect the rupee? So let me take that particular uh, uh, narrative initially. Um, as you know, from the, from the presentation, you would have seen uh, that other countries have used the interest rate to defend their currency. Indonesia has increased its interest rate five times this year. Philippines four times, the Reserve Bank of India twice. But you have to understand that there are significant differences between the conditions in those economies and our economy. What are those differences? Those economies have higher growth rates. India grew at 8% in the second quarter of 2018. Philippines and Indonesia are at about 5% plus. Not only did they have higher growth rates, but they also had lower nominal and real interest rates. So our monetary policy stance is already tighter than theirs. The Indonesian, you have to be a little careful because they have different benchmark rates, but the Indonesian benchmark rates at 5.75, Philippines 4.5, RBI 6.5, we are 8.5 already. 
So we already have a greater tightening bias in our monetary policy than those countries. So with growth already, growth more muted in Sri Lanka than in those countries, and monetary policy tighter than uh, in those countries, clearly the case for uh, tightening monetary policy further is not as strong as it is in those countries. So that is one of the main reasons why the monetary board decided not to increase interest rates. Uh, another factor, which the senior deputy governor has explained on a number of times, is, is you have to ask the question, by increasing interest rates, what is the outcome we will get? Can we attract money in to the country by increasing interest rates? Can we encourage the people who are already here to stay by increasing interest rates? And the answer to both those questions is no. When in, in the current conditions where there is money moving out of emerging markets, given that Sri Lanka is a twin deficit country, it has a budget deficit and a current account deficit, current account is the balance of payments deficit. In such a situation, the chances of Sri Lanka attracting new money at this juncture is very minimal indeed. So then you have to ask the question, can we keep the people who are already here? We have $1.5 billion worth of institutional investment in rupee securities at the moment. By increasing interest rates, will we encourage those people to stay here? The answer to that also is no, because they will, we will impose mark-to-market -market losses on those people, and they will be incentivized to leave. So by increasing interest rates, we will not be able to attract new money, we will not be able to keep the people who are here, incentivized to keep the people who are here also intact. So given all that, the monetary board took the con uh, did, uh, came to the conclusion that it would not increase interest rates to defend the currency. Um, given our particular circumstances, which are different from those of other countries. Um, so what, did the, uh, what has already been done by the government and the monetary board? Uh, um, there has been an accusation that the, both the central bank and the government have not really been very active, have not have been rather, rather dormant, in fact, in terms of action. But the, central, uh, the government and the central bank work together to address some of the problems which were emerging in the trade account. The first was gold, gold imports. As far back as April, the, the, the duty was adjusted to take away the arbitrage opportunity that there was there because we had a zero uh, a duty and India had a 15% duty and uh, people were importing gold into Sri Lanka and smuggling it across to India. Uh, and, and we've talked about this in the previous uh, press conferences uh, and therefore the duty was adjusted to take away that uh, uh, arbitraging opportunity and gold imports have come down dramatically. Then motor vehicles, first there was the um, the tax on so small vehicles was increased because there was a sharp increase in, 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 in uh, small motor vehicle imports. Um, and also there was a 100% uh, margin uh, uh, imposed on LCs open for non-commercial vehicles. Then subsequently, you had the latest raft of measures uh, where you've had a 200% mar margin requirement on motor vehicles and 100% um, margin, margin requirement on selected non-essential goods. Now, there, is, there are people, I've told you why an interest rate uh, defense was not good. Uh, there are people who have said that by imposing these, uh, these margin requirements that we are interfering with the, uh, with the choices of people. Uh, it has also been said that uh, in previous periods, there have not been such problems. Let me recall that in 2015, under this government, about 3.2 billion US dollars were spent to defend the rupee, and the rupee was depreciated by little under 10%, I think 9.5% anyway. So far, we've had a 9.5% depreciation, but on a net basis, on a net basis, so far, we have only spent 188 million. 188 million as against 3.2 billion. Let us go back to 2011, 2012. On a clarification, uh, when you say 188 uh, million, net basis, 188 million dollars sold into the market. Since when? Uh, January to 
20s, I mean the latest. 84. Net basis? 184. 84. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's come down to 184. We just remind, <laughs> CJ reminded me we, we purchased 4 million yesterday. So as of yesterday, uh, it is 184 million. Okay? So January uh, to date, basically, to, to yesterday. So um, uh, essentially, so the story in, you know, 20. 15 was much worse. We have protected reserves. We've only spent 188, 184 million so far. In 2015, uh, under this government, 3.2 billion was spent. And, and the depreciation was similar, 9.4, 9.5. 2011, 2012, and there's a lot of criticism that's being leveled at, at the central bank and the government, 4.1 billion was spent. And the rupee was depreciated by 15%. And it has been said that, that things were managed so well that nothing had to be done. Well, at that time, not only was the rupee depreciated by 15%, there was a credit ceiling imposed. There was an absolute ceiling on credit, which means it doesn't discriminate between luxury goods, essential goods, intermediate goods, capital goods. They all get hit when you have a credit ceiling. Whereas the measures which have been orchestrated this time have been very carefully selected so that you don't touch capital goods, you don't touch intermediate goods, you don't touch uh, essential imports, you only are um, uh, uh, basically focusing on non-essential goods. So this is a far more nuanced and sophisticated intervention than a crude credit ceiling which was imposed in 2012. So I think that is something we need to remind ourselves. I think we tend to have very short memories in this country. <laughs> 